On December 22, 2000, three of the world's greatest art treasures were stolen from the National Museum in Stockholm. Together, the Rembrandt and two Renoir paintings were valued at $50 million. The Stockholm heist was dramatic enough, but so too was the police sting to get them back. The search for the thieves and the missing masterpieces triggered an international police operation. The final recovery was the work of this FBI agent who went undercover to Europe to bargain with the gang who had the paintings. This is the story of the ruthless robbery of three masterpieces and the cunning and daring plan to trap the gang who had them. It is three days before Christmas in the Swedish capital. The streets are busy with last minute shoppers. It all seems so normal. Despite the festive season, at the National Museum on the city's waterfront, there is a steady stream of visitors. They have come to see the priceless collection of masterpieces from across the centuries, one of the finest in all of Europe. In another part of the city, a gang of determined thieves is leaving to commit one of the most audacious art thefts in history. As night begins to fall, the gang make their move. It is barely 10 minutes before the gallery closes for the day. Happily for the thieves, as they step ashore, traffic in the area around the National Museum is in chaos. The fire department has already been called to a car that is on fire on one of the main roads. At five minutes to five, just as the museum is closing, three thieves armed with a submachine gun and two pistols burst into the gallery. They force the museum's security staff and the remaining terrified visitors to the floor. One keeps guard while the other two run upstairs. From the vast collection, they select two Renoir and one Rembrandt. They have been in the gallery less than one minute. The thieves simply cut the frames from the wires on which they are suspended. When the police are finally alerted to the robbery, they find the traffic chaos in the city blocking their way. By now, though, the thieves are already making their escape. They've been in the museum just two and a half minutes. The thieves run out of the building and across the road to the waterfront. At the water's edge, they make for the jetty and their waiting boat.
is now just five past five, and the thieves are heading into the night and into Stockholm's labyrinth of canals. There's not a policeman in sight. On board is their hall of paintings, worth over $50 million. Had they committed the perfect crime? Next morning, Stockholm woke to the news that their national museum had been robbed of some of its most valuable paintings. To many of the city's residents, it wasn't only the robbery that came as a surprise. At first, people got very angry because the traffic situation in Stockholm became impossible. It was Christmas shopping. Uh, but then, when it was known, people got very, very angry. I don't think the Swedish people knew that we had these kind of paintings in our country. At the museum, staff had to reconcile themselves to the tragic loss of the masterpieces. It was a shock for us all, and uh, I remember we were, we were stunned by this uh, event and, you know, speechless, just staring at each other. So uh, it was really a personal loss for, for me and, for, of course, for the, for the curators, too. I was at home baking for Christmas, and uh, a journalist phoned me and said, what can you say about the Rembrandt that has been stolen? I didn't even know, so I got a shock. As they started their investigations, Swedish police had two problems. Who had carried out the robbery, and where were the precious paintings? Police had to reconstruct painstakingly how the gang had carried out their daring raid. One thing soon became clear. It seemed to police an extraordinary coincidence that two car fires occurred near the museum at the same time as the robbery. We got a call around four o'clock that a car was on fire. We went out and when we came around the corner, I saw that the car was in flames. So I went on the wrong side of the road, parked the, the truck, and we started to put out the fire. The two cars blocked the entrance to the peninsula. Well, if you look at this map, you can see the places where the two cars were put on fire. It's uh, marked by the red dots. Here's the museum. From the museum to this point, it's about 100 meters. To that point, it's about 200 meters. And these two places are very important because they are the only ways to this part of Stockholm. No cars could get out to the National Museum. Nobody could get out there and nobody could get in there. We created a chaos in the city. Police became convinced that the car fires were linked to the robbery. They had been started deliberately. This robbery was uh, very well planned because they have these two cars uh, put in fire so they can delay the policemen. Around the cars, there were spikes on the streets to make punctures of the car wheels. They knew from the beginning it wouldn't take a long time for the police cars to arrive. It took police 45 minutes to get through to the museum. When they came to the museum, there were visitors that were crying, personnel that worked there were upset. Some paintings had been cut down from the walls. Among the pictures, uh, there were this Rembrandt self-portrait, valued in several hundred millions of crowns. Police then began interviewing museum staff and eyewitnesses. Here's the main entrance to the museum where the robbers entered. 
police discover that the first thief into the museum actually bothered to buy an entrance ticket. He went up to the stairs. Maybe half a minute later, the two other guys were arriving. The second jumped over the rope and ran up the main staircase. The third arrived in the foyer immediately after. And he has an automatic weapon. It's uh, just before closing time, so it's uh, full of people who are going to leave the museum. So uh, this man is standing here with his automatic gun. Pointed at the guards, telling them to be calm and, and nothing will happen. A crying little girl, uh, three, four years, and uh, teenagers and women. And uh, it's a scary time for them. Once inside the museum, the thieves knew precisely what they were after. They ran directly up the main staircase to the second floor and into the Dutch room where the Rembrandt was hung. You could say they made a good choice because they took some important paintings. The paintings were among the museum's most precious possessions. The Rembrandt was a rare self-portrait painted using an unusual technique. It's painted on copper, gilded copper, and it's an early self-portrait by Rembrandt from 1630. It was really here in this corner, uh, this little Rembrandt portrait uh, was hanging. It was in the much larger frame. It's a very small painting. This is a life-size copy of the painting and it was framed uh, in a very large frame, so uh, it was quite heavy. They cut it down and took it very quickly from the wall. At the same time, the other thief was in the French room. The two Renoir, Conversation and La Jeune Parisienne, epitomized his revolutionary style that had so scandalized Paris at the first Impressionist exhibition in 1874. These are the other two paintings uh, by Renoir, uh, the conversation to the right and the Parisian lady. It's a very small painting that also, so of course they took the small paintings because it was easiest for them. Yeah, they, were, they knew exactly what they were coming for. They had planned it very carefully. They must have um, made studies before of the rooms to be able to just choose the smallest paintings on the wall. But as police soon discovered, security protecting these masterpieces was virtually non-existent. I was a bit disappointed uh, about the museum's security here. I thought that valuable paintings were alarmed. They just hanged in thin wires. And we found out they're not covered with video uh, surveillance. At the beginning, we uh, haven't got a clue who these guys were. With the three small paintings under their arms, the thieves made their escape, threatening passers-by with the automatic weapon as they went. They met a man who was standing on the sidewalk and looking at them. And uh, the man with the automatic weapon, he uh, uh, pointed his weapon on this man and was asking, what are you looking at? And of course, he, he said nothing. They turned left and ran to the boat. They had a boat mowed to the quay. As the thieves made their way back to their waiting getaway boat, they made their first crucial mistake. A mistake that would set in line a sequence of events that would prove essential in solving the crime. It's about uh, here. There was a witness who was working in an office in a boat, and he heard them. They were yelling and shouting and were very happy. 
he saw those guys. It was about three persons on board on this little boat. The whole of Stockholm is surrounded with water. It's a couple of islands that the whole city is built on. The witness took a boat of his own and uh, followed this escape boat. Here is the museum and here you can see the escape route marked with a red line here. The witness drove a bit slowly and suddenly he found a boat. He took his hand on the outboard engine and felt it was still warm. And here's the place. So he understand that it's probably the escape boat and he phoned the police. This is the escape boat. It's a five meter boat with an outboarder. It's quite small. A photograph of the getaway boat appeared on the front page of Sweden's national papers. The first clue that was a real clue for us was that the boat were in the daily newspaper the day after. Around lunchtime this day we had a phone call from a man. He just sold this boat two days ago. I had already bought a new boat and I was uh, put the old one out for sale and this man called and was very eager to buy it. One of the main uh, questions for this buyer was does this engine always start even when it's very cold? I asked why and he said that this friend who will have the boat was very happy to fishing in the winter. But I then realized why they ask that. <laughs> we have a test drive and uh, he was uh, satisfied so he bought it. This is the receipt and the price is 20,000 Swedish crowns. He paid cash. The man that bought this boat, he uh, bought it to borrow the trailer. I said to him that I would have something from him because he would borrow it. He don't have any driving license and... Uh, I want the receipt, he said. He gave me his cell phone number. The phone number was real. This was a terrible blunder by the gang. This cell phone number was a very, very important uh, clue for us. That was uh, probably the biggest mistake they did. That phone number gave us a lot of leads to go for. So that was the key. Meanwhile, back at the museum, Staff hoped that their treasured paintings had not been damaged during the robbery. We were afraid it was lost then. We had all kinds of thoughts. Maybe they lost it in the water and we would never see it again. It was very strange. Or the other idea was that perhaps it had gone abroad already. That they were trying to sell it abroad because they knew the importance of the painting. Forty-eight hours after the robbery, police began tracing the calls from the cell phone number the thieves had left with the boat seller. We could see that uh, this phone number had uh, had contact with several other uh, phones, so we checked them up. Examination of the phone records led police to a gang of crooks based in a suburb to the south of Stockholm. We also got a tip uh, from a local police that these guys, they are not big criminals. They have done petty crimes like car thefts, drug problems, so on. Not masterminds. We uh, had contact with one of them. 
One of the telephone numbers belonged to a known criminal who specialized in stealing particular makes of cars. He could steal cars just like the cars that were put on fire outside the museum. It was through this car thief that police made a bizarre discovery. The car thief had links to two criminals who were actually serving prison sentences at the time in a jail 10 miles from Stockholm. They were a Swedish national named Stefan Nordstrom and a criminal of Russian origin, Alexander Petrov. Had police stumbled on the real brains behind the National Museum heist? We knew that uh, they were uh, friends in prison. This minimum security prison outside Stockholm allows low-risk prisoners out on weekend leave. Nordstrom had absconded on just such a home visit shortly before the robbery. He was still missing. When the prison authorities searched his cell, they found newspaper clippings about previous art heists. And here you can see theft in the modern museum in Stockholm a couple of years before. Here's articles about the robbery at the museum. Well, you have in prison this uh, Russian criminal who loves money. And then you have a Swedish man who has got a lot of knowledge about arts. He's been visiting a lot of auctions in, in Stockholm where they sell fine art. And these two people together in a Swedish prison is not a good combination. It was Stefan Nordström and Alexander Petro. Those two were the brains of this uh, robbery. We think they planned this whole thing in the prison. only happen in Sweden, I think. So um, one could laugh. It should be impossible to sit in a prison to make up these kinds of plans. But they were sitting at a prison where you can do almost what you want. Six days after the robbery, there was another extraordinary development involving the other prisoner, Alexander Petrov. His lawyer contacted the police, offering himself as an intermediary to retrieve the paintings, at a cost of one and a half million dollars each. Chief said that first they have to show us that they really have these paintings. New Year's Eve, our police chief has a call from this lawyer. I now have two photos on these Renoir paintings, and they decide to have a meeting. The police met the lawyer and satisfied themselves that the paintings in the photograph were authentic. These are the photos they showed to the police chief, Renoir paintings, the young Parisian, and the conversation. And after the meeting, the lawyer said that he wants to keep these photos because he had to give it back to the sellers. A little more than a week after the robbery, police knew the identity of key members of the gang. Back at Asptuna prison, Alexander Petrov left to visit his lawyer on the afternoon of January 3rd. He was under police surveillance. Outside his lawyer's office, he was seen in animated conversation with his missing fellow inmate, Stefan Nordstrom. They were having a, a meeting. They were talking about the case, discussing uh, an article in the newspaper. And it, uh, was, uh, it was about the, the robbery, actually. When the two men broke up, Nordstrom made his way to the subway carrying a large bag. Police followed Nordstrom into the station. Oh. 
Stefan Olsen was arrested and in his bag we found Polaroid photos of the stolen arts. It was on the two August Renoir paintings. We found fingerprints on the envelope and also on the uh, pictures. It was Alexander Petrov's fingerprints and also a lawyer's fingerprints. We understand that we have the whole chain. Petrov returned to Asptuna prison later that evening. He was questioned and charged. Meanwhile, police obtained another vital piece of evidence. They traced calls made to the boat seller to a second phone, a public telephone booth located in the Stockholm subway. This phone led to more numbers and more phone taps. In one recorded call, police overheard suspects talking about something mysterious hidden in the cellar of a house. We heard conversation about the thing. When we were listening to this, we understand that something was going on. The state prosecutor decided that we were going to get in in the cellar. They were arrested. We thought that uh, it would be going to be the paintings. It was not the, the paintings. It was drugs. Amphetamine. When the house was searched, they found a crucial piece of evidence, a diary kept by one of the gang members. In this diary, we can see that day after day, he had worked so this robbery could succeed. In August, he had written, getting a boat and 50 hedgehogs, obviously spikes. The diary even mentions contact with Stefan Nordstrom, or Nora, in prison. 22nd of December, uh, the day of the robbery, he had written down, Nora finally succeeded. And after that, he had written it over. So we couldn't see it, but the technicians can see it. After we had read it, we understand that uh, this guy certainly was in this robbery. Police finally had the evidence they needed. By spring 2001, they began making arrests. They never discovered exactly who carried out the robbery, but Alexander Petrov was sentenced to eight years in prison and Stefan Nordstrom to six. But the gang behind the raid, and which might still be holding the paintings, was much more extensive. It also included three brothers of Iraqi origin called Kadum, all of whom were convicted for their part in the plan to steal the paintings. And a man of Bulgarian origin called Alexander Lindgren. Well, of course, it was very good that they caught the thieves and put them in prison. But uh, the paintings were, they didn't get the paintings. But a few months later, they got their first hint that the paintings might still be in Sweden. We got some tips about uh, one of the Renoir paintings, uh, the conversation or conversation. It was out on the street that this painting was uh, for sale. We started with an undercover operation, with a special police agent. He was a buyer of this painting for a customer in London. And the plan was he was going to check it up if the painting was a phony one or a real one. Police contacted the museum to get advice on how an undercover officer posing as an art dealer might behave. One of the policemen came to my home. It had to be very discreet. And I even gave them a little magnifying glass that I had to borrow. And I said, you should look for how the signature, where it is, and you should look at the backside also, and how it is framed, and 
if it's really the painting you are out for. The rendezvous was arranged between the undercover agent and the people claiming to be in possession of Renoir's conversation. The thing was that we are going to see this painting in a cafe here in Stockholm. The three criminals arrived at the cafe carrying a bag. Police hoped inside was the Renoir, but at this stage, they could not be sure. The undercover agent asked them if they had something for him to see. They had uh, the painting with them in a special case for uh, costumes. So they went into the restroom here and uh, showed the, the painting. The policeman was telling them he was expert on arts and so on. So he was looking at the signature and so on and said, it's okay. I have a buyer and he will buy this painting. All of them went out of this coffee shop. The agent gave a sign to the other police officers here. Quite a few blocks away, they were arrested. and we found the painting. That was the first painting we got back. We delivered the painting to the museum, so they were very happy at that time. Obviously, they uh, missed their other two paintings, but uh, that's a different story. But the next chapter in that story was four years and 6,000 miles away in California. Nine months after the 2000 robbery, and unknown to the police in Stockholm, the second Renoir, La Jeune Parisienne, had left Sweden. Shortly before September 11th of 2001, a separate member of the group had smuggled the painting in through the United States through Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, the reason for this was because they felt it was too hot to sell in Europe. The individual, he was a large man, uh, picked for his size. Um, they sewed a pocket in the back of his jacket, slid the painting in the pocket, and then he was just able to walk right through security without being noticed. In fact, it was not until August that the FBI stumbled on the missing Renoir. Organized Crime Squad began a narcotics investigation into a Bulgarian organized crime group. Information was developed through the course of that investigation that a member of that group physically had possession of a stolen Renoir. They were going to sell it in the U.S. They were looking to get uh, one and a half million dollars. We learned through our investigation that they were offered up to three, four hundred thousand, uh, but they declined all offers. So there we were four years later with it still sitting in the city. The narcotic suspect was put under surveillance by FBI agents. We knew that a member of the group was in possession of it. We didn't know where.
central to the secret operation was this man, an undercover FBI agent who had worked for 15 years on some of the biggest art crimes in history. I'm the uh, senior art crime team leader, um, and the reason for that is because in the last seven years I've been involved in the recovery of about $150 million worth of art and artifacts that were stolen worldwide. So I got a call that uh, they had information about a person who might be involved with the, one of the Renoirs that were stolen from the museum. Uh, that particular investigation was, a, was basically an organized crime drug investigation. In March 2005, the FBI learned that the Bulgarian gang was planning to move the Renoir out of Los Angeles. The agents moved in, arrested the man holding the painting, and retrieved the masterpiece. It was in good condition considering that it had been sitting, you know, against the wall of this business for the last four and a half years. It was actually stored in a art folio case wrapped in a couple towels and some Ralph's grocery bags. With the Bulgarian suspect now in custody, the FBI gathered evidence that would lead the trail back to Europe. They were able to develop more information about where Rembrandt was. Um, as a result of that, we were able to make inroads into Stockholm. In the beginning of 2005, I was contacted by the American police, and he wants to have a meeting with me. And I said, of course, you're welcome. So they arrived uh, in the middle of April. It was clear from the FBI that the key to retrieving the Rembrandt was the drug dealer picked up in Los Angeles. He had a contact in Sweden who knew precisely where the painting was. It was his own son, Alexander Lindgren. And he was prepared to betray his son in return for a shorter sentence. This son in Sweden has been contacted by some Arabs who were threatening them and uh, uh, tried to push them to sell uh, this painting. And also there was an opportunity to sell another painting the Rembrandt self-portrait. And when we heard uh, that there were some Arabs, that has to be the Kadum brothers. Swedish police put Alexander Lindgren and the Kadum brothers, all now free again, under surveillance. They began tapping a public telephone used by Lindgren to take calls from his father in America. You have five hours, 36 minutes remaining for this call. Hello. Ah. Yeah, you have a story. Yeah, you have them here. Go lemna green day. Was any dara how is the pink dara something? They were speaking about the painting with the man, the father in the United States. Yeah, I didn't solve them. Yeah, got. The FBI plan was to send Agent Bob Whitman, posing as an art expert, with the Bulgarian informer picked up in Los Angeles to retrieve the Rembrandt. We sat down and we started to hatch a plan where we were going to go to uh, Copenhagen to try to do a recovery. In the summer of 2005, contact was made with the gang. Negotiations began on a price. They wanted one and a half million. We negotiated that down to 600,000. The payment was supposed to take place in two payments, 250,000 when we take possession of the painting and 350,000 after we return to the US and actually sell it. A meeting was set up to take place 
in Denmark in July of 2005. This first meeting took place in the Danish capital, Copenhagen. The money was flashed at that meeting, 50,000. They refused it, insisting on the full 250. It was two months before it became clear that a deal was possible. It was now Agent Bob Whitman's turn to go undercover. In September, we flew to um, Copenhagen, where we met with the, with the Danish police. We set up the operation, uh, and we started making our contacts with the uh, Kadums in Stockholm. Hello. Eventually, on September 14th, we met with a representative of the Kadums, a fellow by the name of Lindgren, and I was able to show him the money. We had $250,000 in cash. Basically, it was 25 bundles of $100 bills. Um, he was able to look at the money, become convinced that we had what we needed, and he then left, went back to uh, Stockholm, and they decided that this was a good deal. The next day, the final sting operation swung into action. September the 15th, we contacted the Kadooms. They said they would come down. They came down to Copenhagen from Stockholm. In Stockholm, as the gang made their way to the station, they were kept under surveillance by Swedish police. With the Rembrandt in their luggage, they caught a train to Copenhagen. The whole time they were surveilled by the Swedish police. It was uh, the two Kadum brothers, I think it was Dia and Baha, and uh, Mr. Lindgren, and they had a package with them. They were carrying a bag with a square item in it that we thought was the painting. Um, it was very difficult. The, the Swedish police did a fantastic job of allowing that painting to come to Copenhagen. I mean, can you imagine? This is one of their national treasures and they were looking at it, they thought it might be that painting right there. Uh, to allow that to leave their country was amazing. That just showed their, their patience and their diligence. They came to, the, to Denmark, uh, they switched trains. We probably had 35 to 40 officers on scene who were actually doing surveillance. Once in Denmark, Danish police took over the surveillance operation. I was not sure if they brought the painting. It was really uh, careful. And uh, that's the reason I don't want to arrest them too early. I want to be 100% sure uh, that uh, we, it was a painting. train and they walked to the hotel. The three of them then circled the hotel a couple of times to make sure there was no policeman there. We came into the hotel and they called us when I went downstairs in the lobby and I sat down with them at a coffee table and we discussed it. It was uh, Mr. Lindgren and it was Baha Kadum. So I said to Baha, I said, how do you want to do this? And he said, well, how do you want to do it? And I said, okay, you got to come to my room. I'll show you the money. Uh, the money's not going to be in the room. You know, I'm going to go get the money because I'm not going to keep the money in the same room that we'd already discussions in. So he said, okay. So we went upstairs. There's no money here. Not yet. I have to go get the money. 
A secret camera had already been set up in Whitman's hotel room. The Danish SWAT team was next door watching. As part of the deal with the police, when Whitman met Baha Kadum, Lindgren's father was there. I left him in that room, went and got the money. It was, it was in a black police, brought it back, and I showed it to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He looked at it, counted every bill, counted every uh, uh, bundle to make sure they were all $100 bills. It was all there. I could see his eyes got wide, and that's what he was interested in, it was just seeing the money. And he looked happy when he was counting it. It was almost like that was the main interest in his life. Many times from my experience when these guys, they see this money, it becomes um, all important to them. And they'll start throwing caution to the wind and doing whatever it takes to get it. And in this particular case, I saw it in Doom's face that he would be that way. And that's when I knew I had him too. I knew I had him. You can have it. Okay. Okay. I said, okay, now you need to go get the painting, bring it back to me, and I'll look at it and authenticate it, and if everything's right, then we'll do the deal. And I said, the money's not going to be here. We're gonna, I'm going to take it away when you leave. And when you come back, we'll go get it together. At this point, Agent Whitman was afraid something had gone horribly wrong. The gang left the hotel in a hurry with the bag containing the painting. He thought his cover had been blown. In fact, they went to collect the real painting from another hotel in a different part of the city. The bag was just a decoy. Had the Swedes or the Danes arrested him on the way, they would have had nothing. There was one last drama. I had checked the uh, the key card on my door and it didn't work. What's more, it was the same key card that the SWAT team would need to get into the room in order to make the arrests. I didn't have a key card to give to the SWAT team so they could enter the room when I gave them the signal, which was it's a done deal. So I ran downstairs very quickly and I got two keys being remade. I came back upstairs and I gave one of them to the SWAT team. And that's when I told them what you know the takedown uh, line's going to be. This is a done deal. Eventually, they came back up to my room. Uh, I was sitting there waiting. I heard a soft knock on the door. So I went to the door, opened the door, and Bob was there. He came in. Um, he handed me a velvet bag, and it was all tied very tightly with string. I didn't have anything to open the bag with, because I had no guns or knives. He had no guns or knives. We had been very careful about that. So it took me about 10 minutes just to get that string off. It was very strong. And I had to bend it around the corner of the, uh, of the bag. You know each other a long time? From Los Angeles. Uh, you don't know each other? No, I'm not into Los Angeles. I'm hard to know. Eventually it did come off. And I, I started to unfold the red velvet. And as I looked down, I saw about half. When I unfolded, I saw half of Rembrandt's face smiling at me. I'm going to go into a dark, uncomfortable bathroom. So I took it into the bathroom. Um, I used an ultraviolet light to rake it. I was looking to see if there had been any uh, retouching. If you see paint on top, it'll it'll be very bright. So I checked that. 
I also looked at some of the crocker, which is a crackling in the painting on the front, to see if it matched crackling that I had looked at in close-ups of the painting in Stockholm, and it did. So at that point, uh, I knew it was real, because I knew it was on copper. It's very hard to fake copper paintings like that. And <clears throat> when I had gotten the pictures from Stockholm of the painting, I had looked at pictures from both front and back, and the ones from the back were really, were really the ones that were more important to me because people who fake paintings fake the fronts. They usually disregard the backs. Baja went into the bathroom with me. I was explaining what I was doing, and after a few minutes, he got bored, and he left. He walked back out to the right, which is what I was waiting for because usually in a hotel room, there's really no place to hide. There's no place that's safe, okay? At least in a bathroom, you have, you have a, a tub. That's the safest place in a bathroom to be and when gunshots, if there's gunshots. So once he left, I knew that I, I was in the bathroom alone with the painting. The Danish SWAT team was waiting for the code words before they moved in. I came out of the room and that's when I said, this is a done deal. Done deal. At that point, I ducked into the bathroom, holding the painting in my arms, uh, cradling it for protection. Uh, I waited quietly. Usually, it, it feels like it's hours before the SWAT team comes in. And that's been my experience. Just because time slows down at that point and things starts, happen, starts happening in slow motion. Um, so I waited. To their credit, it was only a few seconds. I heard the door next door close knowing that the sound was going to happen. I heard them come around. They, uh, they put the key card in the door, and that was the moment that I needed to wait for to see if it worked, and it did. Um, I made a quick left out of the bathroom and out into the hallway. At that point, you know, the, the case was uh, basically done. Another man who had traveled to Denmark was Richard Becklein, the head restorer at the Stockholm National Museum. On a shelf, there it was, this painting, just uh, covered by uh, a blanket, and he, he handed it over to me, and it was a uh, very uh, casual way of <laughs> handing over this uh, priceless work of art. So um, I had the opportunity to check it there uh, with my binoculars and this was the actual painting that was stolen from the museum five years ago. That was quite thrilling for me to be in this happy event. I always feel like a eureka moment. It's not so much the thought of recovering a great piece of artwork. It's the fact that you're recovering something that mankind has lost and that maybe will come back now and will be part of you know future generations. And to know that you're a part of that is it's very, very exhilarating. Uh, it's a really neat feeling. It wasn't long before word got back to Stockholm. Phone me said, I wanted to let you know before anyone else that it will be world news in five minutes that we have recovered the Rembrandt painting in Copenhagen. I was, you know, like, my heart started to jump double. And uh, I was, I felt nervous in a way. I didn't know what to, to do. The Rembrandt arrived back at Stockholm's National Museum just in time for a 400th anniversary exhibition celebrating the great Dutch painter's birth. The police brought it here to us on the evening of the very opening of the exhibition. It was very dramatic because seven policemen marched in in the room and carried the little painting and gave it back to us. We thought maybe we will never see this painting again. It's magic in a way. 